Welcome to the fifth in a series of 20 devotionals in the Lent and Art devotional series. A visual devotional tells the familiar stories of the Bible in a way that primarily addresses your sense of sight. We want you to see the stories in a new and fresh way, and our talented artists have given us a gift by using their gifts. Kelly Bagdanoff has a gift as well, and she is your guide on this journey. Our prayer is that it helps you to see God during this season. In this devotional, there are two basic parts. The first is called the reading. You should approach paintings in the same way you would a book. A book has words that conjure up ideas and images in our head. A painting uses images and is evocative and striking. The symbols and placement have meaning, and we need to read the meaning. In this part of the devotional, Kelly will provide the needed items of background that will help you to read the painting. The second part is the contemplation. Kelly will give you some guidance, but she really wants you to engage with the painting and let it speak to you. Examine the painting, notice the details, read the accompanying passages of scripture, and see where the artist is taking the story. And you will be surprised that you experience the story of Jesus in a fresh new way. We cover 20 different paintings in the whole devotional. You can use them however you like. Three for every week of the Lent season will complete the 20 before Easter. The subject of this video is a painting entitled Christ Washing the Feet of His Disciples by Tintoretto. He painted it in 1548. Thanks for joining us on this tour of Lenten art, and here's Kelly. Today's Lent work is by the Venetian master Tintoretto, and it is Christ Washing the Disciples' Feet. Tintoretto was a man who had many different names. Early on, he was known as Jacopo Coman, his last name being a derivative of the spice cumin. Then he became known as Jacopo Robusti. His father had earned a reputation as a robust fighter in the Venetian Wars. People then began to refer to him as Robusti, and that became the family moniker. Tintoretto was also known as El Furioso because he would paint with such energy and speed. The name that seems to have stuck, however, across the centuries is Tintoretto, which means little dyer. Tintoretto's father, Giovanni, was a dyer of fabrics, and so he was known as the dyer's little boy or the little dyer, Tintoretto. Tintoretto was the eldest of 21 children and showed an artistic bent quite early, drawing on the walls of his father's workshop. His father recognized his talent and took his son to the workshop of Titian to be trained. Titian agreed to take him on, and the story goes that Tintoretto only lasted 10 days due to jealousy on the part of Titian. When Titian found out that the drawings he was looking at were those of this young, untrained boy, he sent him home claiming that he wasn't trainable. True or not, Tintoretto continued to admire Titian's and his work. Titian, on the other hand, had a lot of unflattering things to say about Tintoretto. Some of the negative comments were due to Tintoretto's fast, loose brushstrokes and the emotional style that he had adopted. While Tintoretto's style would eventually gain popularity, during this time it was considered lazy. Often, innovators are looked down on by their contemporaries, and innovations are not valued until later on. Tintoretto was known for painting quickly and with an energy that transferred itself onto the canvas. Tintoretto would ignore the many critics who were unimpressed with his brushwork. Tintoretto actually claimed to be tired of the beauty of Titian and the other Italian masters. He felt that beauty was overrated. While pleasing the eye, beauty didn't move the viewer emotionally. He held to the belief instead that perfect beauty simply wasn't exciting enough to convey the stories of the Bible and make them come alive. Therefore, Tintoretto sought innovations to make his paintings unusual, dramatic, captivating, and tense. His art is different because his goals were different. Giorgio Vasari, a Florentine art critic and biographer, had this to say about Tintoretto. Had he not abandoned the track, but rather followed the beautiful style of his predecessors, he would have become one of the greatest painters in Venice. 
Instead, Vasari felt Tintoretto's work was careless, eccentric, and his drawings were downright crude. Often, great innovators in art concentrate on what they feel are essential, and they don't worry as much about the technical perfection that others might be looking for. That was definitely the case with Tintoretto. In Leonardo's Da Vinci's Last Supper, we find careful composition, perfect balance, even lighting, brush strokes that are so perfect you can't even see them. And while The Last Supper gives us plenty of details to consider, the overall feeling of the painting is one of serenity and beauty. And this is one of the quintessential high Renaissance works. On the other hand, with Tintoretto, we have the opposite in a lot of ways. We have a diagonal compositions, uneven groupings, drama, an exaggerated use of light. Tintoretto painted this work in 1548 for the church in San Marculo and the painting was to hang to the right of the altar. It would be hanging actually opposite another Tintoretto of the Last Supper. Christ washing the disciples' feet was a very popular topic for Tintoretto. He's done at least six paintings that we know of on this theme. So when we view the painting, one of the first things that we notice, as we do with a lot of works in this Lent series, is that we are in a beautiful Renaissance hall with grand architecture and a beautiful view out the back. We are not in Jerusalem in Christ's day. We're in, in the Renaissance. Like El Greco's cleansing of the temple, Tintoretto was trying to show us the timelessness of the story. This is a very complex painting to read with a large group of characters and a lot of iconography that's easy to miss. So before we get to the reading of the painting, I want to read the portion of the Bible that the story comes from so that the details will be fresh in our minds. I'm going to be reading John 13 from the New International Version. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We are going to start reading this painting in the bottom right corner with Christ. Christ's placement immediately tells us that Tintoretto is not your typical 16th century artist. If Christ is portrayed in a work, he is almost universally placed in the center. Tintoretto doesn't place him just slightly off center, but puts him in the bottom corner. It adds an interesting element to how we're supposed to read the story. Beyond that, Tintoretto doesn't just put Christ in a corner, but the rest of the disciples are scattered about in groups that leave large open spaces in the painting. Beyond lending drama and the unexpected to the painting, Tintoretto knew 
where this painting was going to be hung. It was going to be hung on the right side of a church in the altar area. This means it was all the way to the front of the church on a side wall in an area that unless you were a priest, you would never stand right in front of the painting and look at it straight on. Instead, as you sat in a pew, you would be looking at the painting at an angle. That change of perspective would make Christ the first thing you saw, and it would collapse the open spaces in the painting. They would seem to be closer together when viewed from the side. Often artists, if they knew where a piece of art was going to be displayed, they would take that into, into account when they composed the piece. So that's what we have going on here. And as we move from Christ to Peter, so we're looking in that bottom right-hand corner, we see that Peter's hands are raised and he appears to be backing away from Christ. So we are obviously at the part of the story where Peter is horrified that Jesus has taken on the role of the servant and he tells Jesus, you can't wash my feet. And they proceed to have the conversation from the verses that we just read. The painting appears nearly theatrical. It's as if we've walked in on a play and someone yelled freeze right at this moment of the story. As we look around the room, we see that all of the other disciples are responding to the conversation between Christ and Peter. Christ is our humble servant leader, and he's providing the example we are all to follow. And so his disciples respond in a variety of ways. The disciples right in the center, which are probably the first ones that you notice, are almost comic. They're pulling off each other's boots, one of them appearing to be on the verge of toppling over. Then we have, so you have them with this sense of urgency. And then we have the figure in the left foreground. And he's a bit less urgent and is steadily unlacing his shoes. It's been suggested that he represents steady obedience. There's a disciple at the very back, leaning against a power seated on the floor praying. We have another one standing in front of the table, pulling off his sock. And then we have a variety of them sitting around the table. They haven't gotten up quickly to participate like these other disciples, and probably they're discussing what's going on. Generally, a servant would have arrived or the least member of the party would have taken care of the feet washing. So the fact that Christ is doing that would have generated conversation amongst the disciples. And as we continue looking at the disciples, we might notice that there's one lone figure alone and in the shadows, wearing a red hat all the way at the back of the hall. He appears to be a bystander, an outsider. He's separated from the rest. It can be easy to imagine he looks suspicious of them, possibly resentful. This is Judas. One interesting note about Judas is that Tintoretto has chosen to paint him with his halo. Some artists, by this point in the passion story, would have removed Judas's halo. He would no longer be holy, or they would have made it actually a dark halo, because at this point, Judas has already made the decision to betray Christ, and so the halo would have been changed. But Tintoretto has left his halo just like all the rest of the disciples. Judas is lingering in the shadows, and it reminds us that soon we're going to enter into the darkest hours of Jesus's passion. This very night, Judas will betray Christ, he'll be arrested, and the next day we'll be moving into Good Friday. Now we have an odd detail. If we move up into the upper right-hand corner of the painting, that top right corner, there's a doorway we, we can look through into, it's like we're looking into another room. And it, in this other room, all of the disciples in Christ are in that room having the Last Supper. We have them right across the middle of the painting, taking off their shoes and that scene. And that's what's happening in the present. But we also have this view right into the immediate past. They've just finished having the Last Supper. And Tintoretto has clued us into that and included that in the painting. When we read the story, we notice that Christ actually rises during the meal to wash the disciples' feet. So at least a portion of the Passover meal has already occurred when the events in the painting unfold. So we're reminded of this because we have this view up in the corner of the Last Supper happening, and then we have, and that's in the past, and then we have what's going on in the middle of the painting. This is also 
a nod to the fact that this painting, when it was hung in the church, was going to be directly across from another Tintoretto painting, that one of the Last Supper. So he's included that painting in this little room up to the right corner. And in case we need further reminders that this is a Passover meal and that it is the beginning of our practice of communion, on the table where the disciples are sitting, there is a loaf of bread and a jug of wine. So the Eucharist is present. It's in the present. Past, present, and future. All of them are in this painting. The past is in that view into the room where the Last Supper has just occurred. The present is the main scene of the painting with Jesus and his disciples. And the future is in the background. So let's take a closer look at the background. We're looking through the building off in the distance and we see that outside there's a long smooth pool with a boat on it. There's an Ark of Triumph behind the pool and an obelisk next to the Ark. All of these are symbols with their roots in mythology and ancient Greece and Rome. We have classical architecture out there in the back and that's our first clue as to how we're supposed to read the iconography of this portion of the painting. The pool and the boat are symbols from Greek mythology. The pool of water is the river Styx or death and one had to cross the river Styx in the boat which was steered by Charon. Charon's job was to ferry the dead across the river so that you could enter either paradise or hell depending on how your soul was judged. So this image of the river and the boat or the pool and the boat foreshadows Christ's death. We are looking in the background into Christ's future. And although we see that Christ's death is coming, the background is actually quite hopeful because we see that beyond the pool is the Ark of Triumph. So yes, Christ is going to have to die and go across the river Styx or death, but ultimately Christ will be victorious. And we know that because we have an Ark of Triumph there on the other side of death. And we have the obelisk, which is also a symbol of victory. So the background is meant to give us hope. Even though we see that death is coming and we know that Judas is about to betray Jesus, we also know that Christ will emerge from these dark hours victorious. The painting is set in a Renaissance palace, which emphasizes the message that this story is outside of time. We've had Tintoretto remind us that by putting the Last Supper, the past that's already happened in one corner, the present is going on in the center of painting and the future in the background, that we have all of those. But the story itself of Christ humbling himself and washing the disciples' feet is a timeless story. No matter when you live, whether it was in the Renaissance, in Christ's day, or for us in our modern age, the message remains pertinent and timeless. So we have the past, present, and future in the painting. And then we also have the idea that the message that Christ was giving his disciples is timeless. Now, there is one thing that I have failed to talk about. There is a dog in the painting right in the center. That's a little odd. And it actually caused Tintoretto some problems. Paintings that were going to hang in churches were subject to evaluation by the religious authorities. Tintoretto was called before the Inquisition because they found that the dog was irreverent. Oftentimes, the Inquisition would require artists to paint over something that they found objectionable. Tintoretto, when he was called before them, must have made a good argument because the dog remained. So the dog must have served a purpose or Tintoretto made the argument that it wasn't irreverent and they eventually agreed with him. But in Renaissance art, dogs have a lot of symbolic meaning. Dogs can be used to denote faithfulness and fidelity, guidance and protection. So maybe Tintoretto included the dog to signify those things. We're going to be moving on now into our time of contemplation and I want to invite you to consider the painting, especially focus on that strong diagonal movement from the lower right corner where Christ kneels to serve his disciples. We sweep up through the room filled with his followers, including Judas, and we travel over the water or death, and we end in the triumphal arc or the resurrection. Through this sweeping narrative and diagonal, we see a clear visual portrayal of Christ's purpose and his essence of who he was. 
we see the creator of the universe kneeling down to wash the dirty feet of his creation. We see the Lord of Lords who could summon angels to serve him, instead serving a group of fishermen. We see the King of Kings who could slay his enemies with a word, willingly walking towards his own death so that we can be resurrected and we can join him at the Ark of Triumph. Lord, we are undone when we consider the great love with which you loved us. We are overwhelmed by your great mercy toward us. We are humbled by your example. We desire to follow you, but we are weak and afraid. Give us courage to love the unlovely. Give us compassion to lift those who have lost hope. Give us strength to serve where you have served. We pray, Lord, that we would remember that you have given us an example of how to behave. We have learned that no master is greater than the servant and no servant greater than the master. We have learned that the messenger is as great as the one who sent him. And now that we know these things, we pray, Lord, that we will follow your example and that during this Lenten season, we will seek out opportunities to serve those around us. I love you, Baba.